Father, we want to uh, come with this afternoon into your hands. Lord, uh, we pray, Lord Jesus, that Lord, you prepare our hearts, Lord, to receive your word. Lord, we pray that, Lord, uh, your word will feed us, your word will nourish us, and your word will change us. Holy Spirit, we say we need your help, Lord, for clarity, Lord. We pray, Father God, that, Lord, your word, Lord, will transform our lives, will change our lives, Lord. We commit ourselves into your hands, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray, Lord. Amen. I was saying that uh, the first service is like a Toronto Express. Like, so it starts at one point and ends at the last point. The second service is like Razan Express. Like, so some points it does stop, so it's a little bit slower. Third service is Nitravati Express. And so, you know, the evening service. So we are in the uh, Razhani Express. So the common thing is that everything is an express. So, so it is going to be fast. Today I have a challenge of uh, doing two chapters, like, you know, in the time uh, that is allotted. And at the end of the service, communion also. Okay, so it speaks about the Lord's Supper. See how the Lord leads us. Uh, so if you look at First Corinthians chapter ten and words, well, chapter ten and chapter eleven, uh, what uh, touched my heart was this verse from uh, First Corinthians eleven and verse one. It says, "Follow my example, as I follow the example of Christ." And I felt give the time to be an example in Christ. And I think Rashmi read it out for us. Our attitude should be like that of Christ Jesus. Uh, who himself came down and humbled himself. So what is the example that Paul is exhorting the people in Corinth like, no? uh, to be and to be uh, like? So that's what like, you're going to look at in these two chapters. When I was just uh, you know, looking at these two chapters, preparing uh, my notes, I suddenly remembered something that happened in school. And uh, so uh, we would have, like sometimes like, we would have cricket matches after the school pass. So within our class itself, we would divide into two teams and then we would have the match between two teams. Like, so I remember once I was the captain and uh, there was another person who was the captain of the other team and then we divided the teams and uh, we got our people together. And so uh, in my team, uh, there was a, uh, my friend was there, uh, he was slightly on the healthier side. You know, so and not very good uh, with cricket. Okay, so, but, you know, because he was there, he said that we want to, uh, I want to go first. So we said, let's see, why don't we let the others go in like, no, and you watch them, like, right? no, you see how they're playing, and then you can uh, go. And he said, no, every time, like, you people, like, no, you go in first, and then hop the batting for yourself, and then by the time, like, we come in, like, we have three, two, three balls to face, like, no, so I want to go in first. So then, like, you know, we let him go. And so he went into bat, but uh, he was really miserable. So he was all over the place. The ball was hitting him everywhere except the bat. Like, you know, so he was going everywhere. And then like, this continued for uh, some time. After about five minutes, he got out. You know? And so next batsman was, guess who? Who? <laughs> so I was kind of like already gesturing to him and he was kind of like already telling him when he was you know, losing the balls, missing the ball. And I, Come on, like, you know, like, hit something, or hit somewhere. And so he's gone out and gone. And so I'm kind of like gesturing to him with the bat and like, you know, I'm ready to take my stand. And, you know, I'm kind of like telling him with my body language, you, you watch like, you know, how the ball flies. Like, you watch like where my bat goes. Like, you know, you, 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 you watch my stance. And so the first ball, I like, got ready to bat the, the first ball. I lifted my bat. Didn't know when the, where the ball came or when the ball came. And I was clean bowled the first ball. I don't know where to hide my face. And I went back walking, dejected. And this friend of mine, he said, you want me to learn from you? You learn yourself, then I learn from you. I tried to be a good example, failed miserably. You know? And uh, we know that pride and overconfidence goes before a fall. Okay? Now, this is exactly what Paul is telling the church in Corinth. You know, in this, these chapters, that's what Paul is saying. You know that you've been blessed by God. You know that you've been chosen by God. You know that you've been provided by God, protected by God through the desert. You, know, you need to be good examples, but 
you fail miserably. In fact, all of you perish in the desert. You have to be good examples, but you are not good examples. That's what Paul is laying upon the heart of uh, the church at Corinth. And that's what the first thing that he said that uh, I will share. The first thing is, we have chosen to display God to the world. We have chosen to display God to the world. And I'll read for us um, 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 1 to 13. So if you have your Bibles, it's 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and uh, verse 1 to 13. It says, For I do not want you to be ignorant of the fact, brothers, that our forefathers were all under the cloud and that they passed through the sea. They were all baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. They all ate the same spiritual food and drank the same spiritual drink. For they drank from the spiritual rock that accompanied them. And that rock was Christ. Nevertheless, God was not pleased with most of them. Their bodies were scattered over the desert. Now, these things occurred as examples. Okay, as examples. There are the word examples. To keep us from setting our hearts on evil things as they did. Do not be idolaters as some of them were. As it is written, the people sat down to eat and drink and got up to indulge in pagan revelry. We should not commit sexual immorality as some of them did. And in one day, 23,000 of them died. We should not test the Lord as some of them did and were killed by the snakes. And do not grumble as some of them did and were killed by the destroying angel. These things happened to them as examples. Again, the word examples. And were written down as warnings for us on whom the fulfillment of the ages has come. So, if you think you are standing firm, be careful that you don't fall. No temptation has seized you except what is common to man. And God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. But when you are tempted, He will also provide a way out so that you can stand up under it. So, that's what like Paul is saying, sharing with the Corinthian church, that these people, Israelites, they were led through the desert by the cloud. They passed through the Red Sea. They, this was like baptism for them in Moses, just as we are baptized in Christ. Right? They, were, they were carried by the fire and they were carried by the cloud. So they were baptized into Moses. Now, so these are special people. They had mother in the desert and they had water from the rock. And this rock was not a sp this physical rock, but it was a spiritual rock. And if you see the Greek translation, it says that Petras was Christos. That Petras was Christos. Christos, the anointed one, the, the Messiah, the Christ. And so you drank from the anointed one. And uh, that's what like Rajesh Kumar also shared with us last week when he shared about the Samaritan woman. Jesus answering the Samaritan woman in John 4 10. Jesus answered, If you knew the gift of God and who it is that asks you for a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. You drank from the living water. That's what like God did for you. Yet all of them fell in the desert, except Joshua and Caleb. Because they were chosen once. No, they were not excluded from judgment. Okay? They were chosen, but still their judgment was pronounced upon them. They were chosen, but they had a responsibility. Instead, they felt because they were chosen, they could indulge in anything. No, they had a responsibility. They had to be good examples to one another and to the world outside. But they failed in being a good example. And Paul says, Paul points out four temptations under which they succumb. Temptation to idolatry. Okay, so they worship. They they made a golden calf when Moses, their leader, failed to return or delayed in returning from the Mount of Sinai. They made golden calves, worship, and said, "These are the gods that led us, and these are the gods that will lead us also to the promised land." There was a temptation to fornication. They indulged in sexual relationships with Moabites and Midianites. Of people whom God had said not to associate with. And so they indulged uh, in fornication. So that was the second temptation. The third temptation was the, the temptation of testing God. You know? And uh, so they said, God, uh, though we were in bondage, though we were in slavery, we think Egypt was better. You know? We did well. The things were good in Egypt. And so they tested the Lord God Almighty. And lastly, temptation to grumble, grumble. They grumbled for water, they grumbled for food. They also grumbled against their leaders, Moses and Aaron. 
So they grumble against Satan. So these are the four temptations that God is saying, that, that Paul is saying that you succumb to. And Paul is saying here two things. One is he's saying, God has been good to you. So be a good example to the world. So he is quoting the example of the Israelites. They were bad examples. So he's telling the church of Corinth, you know, God has been faithful to you through Jesus Christ. And so we need to be good examples to the world around us. And Paul is saying, even when you are tempted, God has made a way out through Christ. Hallelujah. Even when we are tempted, God has made a way out through Christ Jesus. That's what he says in 1 Corinthians 10, 30. No temptation has seized you except what is common to man. And God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. But when you are tempted, He will also provide a way out. Can we underline those words? Provide a way out. And you can write on top of that, Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ was a way out through our temptation. Jesus Christ was a way out. So we have a way out. So if we see, uh, if we yield to temptation, we fall into sin, we yield to sin, we die. But Jesus was tempted, did not yield to temptation, did not sin, yet he died. So he they took the penalty of temptation for us. And so temptation, if we believe in what Christ Jesus did for us on the cross, temptation has no power over us. Hallelujah. No power. Because he has taken the power, the ultimate penalty for temptation, death. And he rose up again victorious. And so when we believe in him, temptation has no power over us. We, that's why he says, no temptation has ceased to that, except that which is common man. And he provides a way out for us through Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. I remember listening to this story about a man and uh, he was uh, an older gentleman and uh, very faithful to God uh, and serving and uh, very helpful to people. So, but he was struck with the sickness. He was struck with the sickness. And he was sick in bed for months together. And he was bedridden for months together. So, people were wondering, what has happened to this man? A faithful man? A, a man who loves God? A man who is helpful to others? And he is lying in bed in sickness? What is God doing to him? What has he done? And so some of the people came to him and said, I mean, uh, what is happening to you? Why are you suffering so much? You're a good man. You love God. You don't help people. What is happening to you? And this man says that sometimes God puts us on our back so that we may look up to him. Sometimes God puts us on our back so that we may look up to him. He went through the temptation of grumbling against God. He went through the temptation of being angry with God, or saying things against God. But, Christ has set us free from every kind of the power of temptation. Christ has set us free. And so, even in that painful situation, the situation of crisis, we do not fall into that temptation. We can glorify God. Hallelujah. We, need, we can have a godly response. And this man, he blessed God. And so he was a good example. Even in that difficult time, he was a good example did not succumb to the people who were sharing things against him and against God. So, we can be an example because Christ became the example for us. We can be an example because Christ became the example for us. The second thing that Paul is sharing here is with freedom comes responsibility. With freedom comes responsibility. Okay, so again we go back to the Bible, chapter 10, verse 14 to 33. It says, Therefore, my dear friends, flee from idolatry. I speak to sensible people. Judge for yourselves what I say. Is not the cup of thanksgiving for which we give thanks a participation in the blood of Christ? And is not the bread that we break a participation in the body of Christ? Because there is one loaf, we who are many are one body. For we are all, we all partake of one loaf. Consider the people of Israel. Do not those who eat the sacrifices participate in the altar? Do I mean them that a sacrifice offered to an idol is anything or that an idol is anything? No. But the sacrifices of pagans are offered to demons, not to God. And I do not want you to be participants with demons. You can drink, you cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of demons too. 
you cannot have a part in both Lord's table and the table of demons. Are we trying to arouse Lord's jealousy? Are we stronger than he? Everything is permissible, but not everything is beneficial. Everything is permissible, but not everything is constructive. Nobody should seek his own good, but the good of others. Eat anything sold in the meat market without raising questions of conscience. For the earth is lost and everything in it. But some unbeliever invites you to a meal, and you want to go, eat whatever is put before you, without raising questions of conscience. But if anyone says to you, this has been offered in sacrifice, then do not eat it, both for the sake of the man who told you and for the conscience sake, the other man's conscience, I, I mean, not yours. For why should my freedom be judged by another's conscience? If I take part in the meal with thankfulness, why am I denounced with, because of something and thank God for? So, whether you eat or drink, or whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. Do not cause anyone to stumble, whether Jews, Greeks, or the Church of God, even as I try to please everybody, in every way. For I am not seeking my own good, but the good of many, so that they may be saved. Okay? So Paul is sharing a few guidelines you know, for the people in Corinth and for us also. What he is saying is that the earth and all that is in it belong to the Lord. So therefore everything is clean. We don't have to live in, a, in fear and in guilt for what is happening around us. For example, Suppose like I am walking on the street and it's a hot sunny day and I am feeling really tired and uh, I find a tree you know, and so I go and take shade under, under the tree and take my bottle of water and start drink, drinking this water. As I am drinking water, I see that there are a lot of threads on the tree. So what do I do? Run away? No. So I say to myself, he that is in us is greater than he that is in the world. So finish my bottle of water, you know, finish being refreshed and then move on. Because, you know, it belongs to the Lord. Suppose we go to a hotel early in the morning, you know, and uh, we are the first customer in the hotel. And then you order something. My favorite is masala dosa. So I order masala dosa. You know? So I'm the first customer and the first item they make is masala dosa. So the first item. So I am the first customer, and, and the first item that it. So as it comes, it dawns on me. So what do I do? Run away, go to the toilet, and have spiritual warfare, binding, losing. No, no. I bless the food and eat the masala dosa and order extra sambar also. <laughs> Hallelujah. You know? So I mean, everything belongs to the Lord. You know? We enjoy that. We bless it, and and it is sanctified. Because it belongs to the Lord. God, suddenly, what Paul is saying is, God is all powerful and above all things, above all, above all kinds of worship. God is powerful and above all kinds of worship. So, so I'm at rest. I'm at peace because He's, He is above all. So I'm at rest and peace. But we are one body with the Lord. We cannot have a union with anything else. We're one with Him. So we are one with him. That means I am in him and he is in me. And there is no part of me that I can give to something else to worship. There is no part of me because I belong to him. I am in him and he is in me. And I cannot, I cannot partake of anything else. And so here Paul is saying about food or food to other gods. But what about it? I am just saying, what about lust? You know, that we give ourselves to. What about money? You know, what about uh, power? Uh, what about fame? What about ministry? Sometimes we offer ourselves to worship. We cannot. We cannot do that because we are one in Him, in union with Him. There is no part in us that belongs to us, but everything belongs to God Himself. You know, there's a story told about. Prince Charlie from England and uh, at a time when they were going through a rebellion, he was fleeing from these people like, who were causing this rebellion and uh, uh, so he fled from that place and uh, he took rescue among eight people who were outlaws and criminals okay? and uh, the price that was on Prince Charlie's head was 30,000 pounds at that point of time. Uh, so he came to uh, to these people who were outlaws and criminals and they didn't have a single chip. They didn't have a single penny uh, with them. So 
Uh, so these people could have handed him over so that like they would become rich. But none of them betrayed him. They kept him safe and secure. Okay? And at the end of the rebellion, what happened was that he was released and these eight men became famous. One of them went to a place called Edinburgh and he met people and various people would come to him and ask him the story, how was it like when Prince Charlie stayed with you? What did you all do? Like, how did you all keep him safe? And you all did such a marvelous job. And uh, so he would share with them. But one thing these people noticed was that this man always gave his left hand to shake his hands with the other people. Always gave his left hand. And so some of them came and asked him, I mean, why do you always shake your left hand? You know, give your left hand for shaking hands with others. And he said that, you know, I, when Prince Charlie left, he shook hands with all the eight people. This hand that has been given to Prince Charlie shall not be given to anyone else. He had that kind of a devotion to his prince. It belongs to him and it shall not be given to anybody else. I want to say, we, our lives, belong to God and not to anyone else. Hallelujah. It cannot be shared. There is no share at all to be given. We cannot it's been devoted to God, given over to God. It belongs to Him. That's the heart that Paul is sharing with the people of Corinth. And uh, that's what like, we need to remember also. Then, uh, my freedom should not cause a weaker brother to fall. My freedom, that's the other thing that Paul is saying. My freedom should not cause a weaker brother to fall. It says in 1 Corinthians 10, 23 and 24, everything is permissible, but not everything is beneficial. Everything is permissible, uh, but not everything is constructive. Nobody should seek his own good, but the good of others. So here we see that there is a law of permissibility and there is a law of profitability. And what Paul is saying, if we may be strong, our faith may be strong, we may not be disturbed. Uh, so we can worship, it does not affect us, but if my permissibility, you know, you know, my freedom causes a weaker brother to fall, I will follow the law of profitability and not the law of permissibility. Because my freedom causes a weaker brother or sister to fall. And that's what like Paul is encouraging the church at Corinth. Now say for example, I'm just saying the issue of drinking. The issue of drinking. So if you look at it biblically, we will see the Bible speaks about abstinence, the Bible speaks about moderation, and the Bible speaks about drunkenness. So we are all clear about drunkenness. But what is the issue that we struggle? Moderation. Because what is moderate is a question. And we are clear about abstinence, staying away, away from. So, so what stand? So what is moderate? How do we say this is moderate? One thing is moderate, on the rocks is moderate, or now what is moderate? So, so that's the big question. Now, when we live in a culture like this, where alcohol is, uh, is taken seriously, you know, so we as a church, the leadership has taken a stand, that at least a leadership, we will follow the law of profitability. Don't spur us, but we will follow the profitability law because it can cause a weaker other to fall. Now, Oh, now, this is not a law from the church or a rule from the church. Who has to decide? We have to decide. We have to decide. This is up to us for us to uh, decide. And uh, we need to see this freedom I have, but should I choose to exercise this freedom or forego my freedom to build up uh, my brother? I remember one boy came to his father and said, Dad, I mean, all my football friends, they drink beer. And they invite me, and I can't drink beer because we don't drink beer at home, and you don't drink beer. So, I mean, you don't drink beer, that is your conviction, but why do I have to follow it? And, uh, I mean, they are, I'm with them, what's wrong in that? So, his dad told him, I mean, son, I mean, you're free to choose, but we'll tell him the story why we stopped drinking. So, and they said, that one day they went to church and there was a new family that came to church. A 
and that family will see Christ as their Lord and Savior. And they were excited in their faith. So this, the father and mother went back home and, and invited this couple, this new couple, home for dinner. And so this new couple came in. And we, like when they came in, after, some, after talking to them, we went to our bar, opened the bar, and served them beer. And these people, they looked shocked when we offered them beer. They said, we came back from this life to receive Christ. And you who follow Christ, do the same thing. This is what you people are and your faith are, faith is. And we don't want to do anything with your or with Christ. We stopped on the house that evening. And this father and mother were absolutely shocked, stunned to see the response of this father. And they realized what an example they had been to this father. In fact, who had known Christ. And this father said, we went to the bar, took out every bottle from there, and poured out all the contents down the drain. And that was the last day that we drank any From that day onwards, we never touched alcohol. The father tells his son, son, it's for your juice. Your juice for his blessing. The son said, ah, now I understand why you don't drink. I do want to be a good example. I understand the reason why you don't drink. So, uh, we, so Paul is saying that uh, there is a law of permissibility and there is a law of profitability, which we need to decide as people of God. Then, next one, what Paul says is modesty and submission adorns a follower of Christ. Modesty and submission adorns a follower of Christ. So, we'll read. Chapter 11, verse 1 to 16, okay. it says, Follow my example as I follow the example of Christ. I praise you for remembering me in everything and for holding me on holding to the teachings just as I pass them on to you. Now, I want you to realize that the head of every man is Christ and the head of every woman is man and the head of Christ is God. Every man who prays or prophesies with his head covered dishonors his head. And every woman who prays or prophesies with his head with her head cut covered, dishonors her head. It is just as though her head were best shaped. If a woman does not cover her head, her head, she should have her hair cut off. And if it is a disgrace for a woman to have her hair cut or shaved off, she should cover her head. A man ought not to cover his head, since he is the image and glory of God. But the woman is the glory of man. For the man, for man did not come from woman, but woman from man. But neither man came Man, neither was man created for woman, but woman for man. For this reason, and because of the angels, the woman ought to have a sign of authority on her head. In the Lord, however, a woman is not independent of man, nor is a man independent of woman. For as woman came from man, so also man is born of woman. But everything comes from God. Judge for yourselves. Is it proper for a man to pray to God with her head uncovered? Does not the very nature of things teach you that if a man has long hair, it is a disgrace to him, but that if a woman has long hair, it is for it is her glory? For long hair is given to her as a covering. If anyone wants to be contentious about this, we have no other practice, nor do the churches of God. It is very, very clear, this passage. You don't know what is to be cut, whether the head is to be cut or the hair is to be cut. <laughs> Whether it's a man's head or a woman's head. <laughs> okay. Now, Paul is sharing few things in this. Now, and this context is purely local and has temporary significance. What he shares in this passage is purely local and has temporary significance. Now, in those days and even now, if you look at Eastern women, what are they clad in by? I mean, what do they wear? Yeah, so when you go to the Middle East, yeah, so, so they had these coverings that were there and in those days they were called Yashma, what we call Burkas that were there. And so they would wear, wear that veil, like it would be from the forehead right down to their feet. That was there. 
in Corinth, like you think more strict, like it was like there would be a slit open for their eyes, you know, and then the whole body would be covered. Now, that, like for a woman, for a respectable Eastern woman, you know, that would be something that would give her dignity, you know, and honor when she would go around wearing this. So that was a normal culture, the norm over there in that particular place. And that meant two things. One, she was subject to a man. She was under authority. She was a woman under authority. And when she wore that and went to places, it was also a sign of power, of dignity and honor for the woman. So that is what they wore and they went around with that. Secondly, she was protected with that. She was protected with that. She could wear that and go to any place and uh, it would be secure, it would be safe for her to go to any place. And that, so that would kind of like offer security and respect for the woman. So this is the context in which Paul is sharing with the church of Corinth. That's the first thing. Secondly, he knew the situation in Corinth because people of Corinth worshipped the goddess of love. And there were women devotees of prostitutes who would be released in the evening and they would come down from the temple to the city and they would indulge like, in their devotion with people. And uh, that was what which was prevalent. So Paul is saying outside there is filth, outside there is adultery. In the church there should be devotion, reverence, respect and the adoring of Christ with the way you come and dress yourself also. That's what exactly Paul is saying. Okay, and we'll come down to uh, come down to that uh, what the couple of things that Paul is sharing. So that's why like Paul says, now I want you to realize the head of every man is Christ. And the head of woman is man. And the head of Christ is God. Every man who prays or prophesies with his head covered dishonors his head. And every woman who prays or prophesies with her head uncovered dishonors her head. It is just as though her head were shaved. If a woman does not cover her head, she should have her hair cut off. And if, it, and if it is a disgrace for a woman to have her hair cut off or shaved off, she should cover her head. So basically what Paul is saying is three things. One, whatever we wear, be modest. Okay? Basically that's it. Be modest. Whatever you wear. Whatever we wear, be submissive. Okay? So it's not the cover. Be modest and be submissive. So, and in this we honor and give reverence to God and to one another. Okay? So let's not get confused with the hair and the head and the man and the woman. So this is basically the crux of what Paul is saying. So if you ask me, Pastor, I want to cover my head, I will say, please cover your head. And then I'm saying, uh, so, but be submissive. But if you say, Pastor, I don't want to cover my head, I will say, don't cover your head, but be submissive. But sometimes like, we can wear a white sari and white scarf. So everything and say, who made you pastor? <laughs> so everything outside is godly, but inside is dirty. <laughs> so we need to beware of that. Sometimes there is an external form of godliness, but inside you're far away from God. That's not what Paul is saying. So basically. These are the aspects that Paul is addressing the people of God and to us. Lastly, our eating should be an example in Christ. Eating also should be an example in Christ. So the last portion, verse 17 to verse 34, it says, In the following directives, I have no praise for you, for your meetings do more harm than good. In the first place, I hear that when you come together as a church, there are divisions among you. And to some extent I believe it. No doubt there, there have to be differences among you to show which of you have God's approval. When you come together, it is not the Lord's Supper you eat, but for, for as you eat, each of you goes ahead without waiting for anybody else. One remains hungry, another gets drunk. Don't you have homes to eat and drink in? Or do you despise the church of God and humiliate those who have nothing? What shall I say to you? Shall I praise you for this? Certainly not. For I received from the Lord, but I also passed down to you. The Lord Jesus on the night that is prayer, he took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it, and said, This is my body, which is from you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way after supper, he took the cup, saying, 
this cup is a new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Therefore, whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of sinning against the body and blood of the Lord. A man ought to examine himself before he eats of the bread and drinks of the cup. But anyone who eats and drinks without recognizing the body of the Lord eats and drinks judgment on himself. That is why many among you are weak and sick, and a number of you have fallen asleep. But if we judged ourselves, we would not come under judgment. When we are judged by the Lord, we will be disciplined so that we will not be condemned with the world. So then, my brothers, when you come together to eat, wait for each other. If anyone is hungry, he should eat at home, so that when you meet together, it may not result in judgment. And when I come, I will give further directions. No, no. In those days, like when people would gather together in their culture, they would have something called love feasts or agape feasts. So, and every time that they gathered together, so there would be the rich and poor who would come together and they would bring their food. Sometimes the people who were well off would bring a lot of things, you know, and the people who, uh, who were poor like, would bring whatever they had. But all of them shared, sat down together, talked to one another. You know, and uh, that was what would happen. Actually, for the Greek people, you know, the main meat was not the breakfast. Breakfast was like bread dipped in wine and they would like quickly have the breakfast. Lunch would be somewhere outside, maybe on the streets, wherever they're working. But the main meat was their dinner or their supper, let us say. And that meal would not only be a meal, but also be a time of fellowship where they will be, they will linger around, you know. There will be no rush to get back. But they will sit down, chat with one another, enjoy the fellowship meal, enjoy the friendship. But what was happening in Corinth, which Paul highlights, is that the people who were well off would bring their food and they would sit down in their own plates and groups. And they would, be, and they would finish off the food, that which was still laid there, and the good things, they would finish off. So by the time the others would come, they would not have food to eat. They would go back hungry. Some would go back hungry. Some would go back drunk. Paul is saying, this cannot be. This is not a representation of Christ. This is not a representation of a Christian meal or a fellowship or a supper that is there. And so that's what like Paul is saying over here. He's saying when you come together, it is not the Lord's Supper you eat. But as you eat, each of you goes ahead without waiting for anybody else. One remains hungry, another gets drunk. Do you have homes to eat and drink in? Or do you despise the church of God and humiliate those who have nothing? What shall I say to you? Shall I praise you for this? Certainly not. But the most beautiful thing is that in this context of their uh, uh, agape feast, their love feast, they would also have the Lord's Supper. So they would have this meal and then go to break bread, have communion with the Lord. You know? So break bread together. So Paul here is contrasting between their love feast and the love feast of the Lord. The Lord's Supper, the communion that he shared with us and we see uh, the example of Christ. We see how Christ prepared the table for his disciples. It was between the Son of God and with men of God. The Son of God, one who was rich, almighty, all powerful, came down had a meal with the people, mere people. It was a meal with Jews, but also for the whole world that he extended for us. It was a meal initiated by him and born by him. It was a, it was a symbol of absolute generosity. It was a most expensive meal where he broke his body and shed his blood for that meal, for that communion. It was a symbol of intimacy, God and man, in covenant, in friendship with one another. And it is a symbol of eternal union. It signifies what will happen when the wedding of the Lamb would be announced. That wedding feast. So it's kind of a foretaste of heaven, that which he did with us. And it was a symbol of absolute love. The Paul is saying, look at your love feast and look at the Lord's Different. This is how you need to be an example, a Christian 
example. And that's what my Paul is saying over here. So then, my brothers, when you come together to eat, wait for each other. If anyone is hungry, you should eat at home. So that when you meet together, it may not result in judgment. That's what my Paul is saying. Contrasting the two love feasts. I want to close this morning. I want to share something that happened in a winter camp. And uh, in winter camp are exciting times. And everybody is excited. And uh, they all trek quite a bit. And they were getting to the place, the hill, where they would kind of lay the tent and have the meeting. But uh, as they were moving towards the place, uh, the news uh, got to them that uh, the tempo that was carrying all the food material that broke down in some place. So that means evening dinner is a question mark. So when this was announced, then everybody is thinking about food. Now everybody had brought their lunch bags. They had brought their lunch bags. And so everybody is thinking about the food and you know, how their friends. You know? And so immediately then, uh, when Stanley got to know, so he said, everybody who has anything to eat over there, we are laying a few bed sheets over here on the ground. So anything that you have for to eat, please come and lay it down on this bed sheet. So, so some people got wafer, samosa, whatever they had, idli or whatever. And so he announced, each of us will make a line, make a queue, and then we will take one item out of this spread. That is so if you want to go for the idli, go for one idli. Okay. If you want to go for a sandwich, go for one sandwich. So we will let everybody take one turn, okay. and then if there is leftover, we will go for the second helping. I believe that they went through about two or three helpings, and everybody had enough that was there. So they enjoyed that because there was no dinner in the night. Because in the night, in the evening, they had to bring up the cylinders, the gas cylinders, because the vehicle had broken down. And they bring up gas cylinders. The next meal that they had was only breakfast. But they had a great love feast. Hallelujah. That's what a Christian meal is about. That's what a, a, you know, a love feast is about. Where, where, where we share with one another. And that also represents what Christ did for us.